I come from a family of eight, and uh, I'm the middle, the middle of the middle. And if you know anything about big families, you know that the oldest, you, you get to do whatever you want. I don't know. The baby, you get to do whatever you want. The middle, you get to do whatever you want because no one pays any attention to you. <laughs> but the reality, of course, um, is just dumb, you know, but when I was growing up, my siblings are pretty impressive. My older siblings are amazing. My younger siblings are even more amazing. And there were times when, in the midst of this whole family, that just were, they seemed to be really amazing, seemed to be just incredible. I felt like, I, I don't know if I'm really wanted here. So there are times, I mean, I remember really specifically, uh, I was like, I'm running away. So I did this. I, I, I got, you know, a suitcase, um, and I threw some clothes in it and came down with the, downstairs with the suitcase. My mom was in the kitchen. She's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm running away. And she said, do you want me to make you some lunch? I said, Yes. So she made a sandwich and put it in a little bag, and I took it, put it in my suitcase, and I, st I walked out of the house. And I'm in the front yard, my, my siblings were playing. They were playing catch or something in the front yard, and uh, I come out with a suitcase, and they're like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm running away. I'm like, what? I'm like, I'm leaving. So I remember I walked down the driveway. I walked up the hill. We were at the bottom of a hill. Started walking up the hill and walking away. And every step, I mean, and I wanted to be gone. I wanted to be gone. But more than wanting to be gone, what I wanted was I wanted to be chased after. And every step up that hill, away from my home, I just wanted them to run after me. And, and they did. Because they wanted me. Even though I didn't feel like I belonged there. I didn't feel like I was wanted. A couple weeks ago, we went, I went on a mission trip with a bunch of uh, youth from my diocese. And there's this one young woman, and, and she just said, she said, in one day she got over two of her three biggest fears of her life. Two of her biggest fears were Heights, and we went to an amusement park that day, and she said, conquered on the roller coaster. I'm no longer afraid of heights. I'm like, that's awesome. She said her other biggest fear of her entire life was that she would go through the rest of her life not knowing if she was safe, loved, or wanted. But on that trip, she met some adults who really, I mean, just youth ministers. There's some priests on the trip with us. They just, they just, they, she said, when I looked at them, I, I felt safe, loved and wanted, all at the same time. She's like, I'm no longer afraid of just not being wanted, not being loved, not being safe, ever, ever, ever again. I don't have to ever be afraid of this. But so many of us are, we're afraid that you're here. I mean, even you came into this weekend, I'm afraid I'm here, but I don't really belong here. I'm not really wanted here. And that's why we have to just hear this one more time tonight. It's Luke chapter 15, and you've heard it already, but I'm going to say it again, the whole thing. It said that the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus. Now think about this. These are people who don't belong in church. They are the bad guys. And they, will all, they were all drawing near to listen to Jesus. But the Pharisees and the scribes, church people, began to complain, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So to them he addressed this parable, and he said, What man among you, having a hundred sheep, losing one of them, would not leave the ninety-nine in the desert and go after the lost one until he find it? And when he does find it, this is important, when he does find it, he sets it on his shoulders with great joy. And upon his arrival home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and he says to them, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. And this is, this is crazy. 
because I know this. I know this about so many people here tonight. I know this about when you say, well, okay, if I'm going to be in church, i got to be perfect. If I want to be in church, if I, want to, if I want God to love me, if I want to be safe, loved, and wanted in church, if I want to be safe, loved, and wanted by God, what I have to do is I have to be perfect. I have to be, I have to be all put together. I have to be unbroken. Do you realize that is the exact opposite of Christianity? Did you know that that's, that was the case before Jesus came on the scene? In fact, if you went to church before Jesus, it's called BC, if you went to church before Jesus, you'd go into the temple. Because here's the thing about the gods, the temple gods. Like here's the, you know, the Roman gods. Here's Apollo or Zeus or Mercury or Hera or Aphrodite or any of those gods. You know, the, you know this thing about those gods is they weren't good. If you've ever read any of the, any of the Roman myths or Greek myths, the gods weren't good. They were just more powerful. The gods didn't care about you at all. And they did not, they did not love you. And so you would go, the reason you go to the temple of Aphrodite is because you wanted to get her attention. And so you'd go to Aphrodite and you'd offer up some kind of sacrifice. Basically saying, Aphrodite, over here, look over here. Now please give me what I want. Or if you're going into battle, you go to the temple of Mars and you'd offer a sacrifice and say, okay, Mars, look over here because I know you're not paying attention to me. So look over here because I'm going to offer you a sacrifice so you start looking at me. In fact, there was this crazy, there was this one of the Babylonian gods, he was a god of war. And what you would do is you'd go to this god of war's temple and you'd offer a sacrifice. And if you still didn't think that he was paying enough attention to you, if you did, still, didn't let, still didn't think that, that was, would do the trick, what these soldiers would do is they would take, off, take out their daggers, take out their swords, take out their spears, and they'd start slashing their own bodies, start stabbing themselves until the blood flowed. Basically trying to say, God of war, see that I'm willing to bleed for you, so you give me what I want. Realize how, how crazy this is. I mean, how crazy it is for us, because this is what I know so many Christians, this is how they see God. They don't believe in a God who loves them. They believe in a God who tolerates them. We believe in a God who likes to stay on his shelf, likes to stay, keep his distance. And yet, the crazy thing about this God that Jesus reveals he is, is this, as opposed to you having to go to church to get his attention, hey, over here, please bless me. We realize God is always, always present, not wanting you to bleed to get his attention. Actually, we believe in a God who he bled to get your attention. He bled so you would look at him and look up and let him get close. Yeah, that's, the, again, the crazy thing is so many of us, we, I mean, we don't believe God's watching us. And if we think God's watching us, we're like, God's watching you. We're like, what? That seems creepy. <laughs> I would say this, God is attentive to you. At every single moment of every single day, God is attentive to you. He is paying attention to you. He's like, yeah, but he sees all the bad stuff. Yes, and he still wants you. That's a crazy thing. He sees all the bad stuff, and he still wants you. The re reality that Jesus reveals is you don't have to be perfect. He's not waiting. He's not waiting to love you. And he's not disgusted by you. And he's not troubled by your wounds. In fact, the crazy thing about this is this. Your wounds, because every single person here has wounds. Every, when I say wounds, I mean the stuff that we hate about ourselves. I mean our sins. I mean the brokenness. Those wounds can either be obstacles or they can be God's access points to your heart. That decision is yours. Everyone here has wounds. Those wounds can either be obstacles. You can say, nope, God, I'm not letting you get close because look at this wound I've got. Or you can let those wounds be God's access points to your heart. Because we have to get really practical tonight. We have to get really, really practical about letting God love us. Because here's Jesus. He's trying to chase you down. He's trying to track you down. And there's one way that we as Catholics, we know we can let him find us. And my question for you is this. Are you willing to let Jesus find you tonight? Are you willing to let him find you tonight? Are you willing to let Jesus love you tonight? This is really practical. Are you willing to give him your sins? Are you willing to go to confession? Oh, of course, he had to bring up confession. Oscar was talking all about it earlier. I thought that was all, that was it. We're done for the night. No, we're talking about confession. Here's what we're going to talk about confession. Is this, go. And that's more or less it. It's like the instructions about how to make a Pop-Tart. Toast the Pop-Tart. 
People get, I talk to so many people who are like, I can't go to confession. I'm like, how come? They're like, I don't know what to do. You don't know what to, okay, listen, if that's you, like, I don't know how to go to confession. I'm Catholic, I've, I don't, I've been gone so long, I haven't gone to confession. I don't know what to do when I get in there. Okay, we broke it down into simple steps. Actually, we hand this to all of our youth up in the Diocese of Duluth. This first step is this, enter the confessional. I mean, we, we make it really easy. And if you don't know what to do after you enter the confessional, look at the priest or sit down in the chair, say, Father, I'm not sure how to start. No, here's the thing. He went to school for this. <laughs> he knows how to help you out. So all you have to do is, Father, I, I'm, I sat down. That's, that's your only step. Your only step. Sit down with the, with the priest. <laughs> Father, I'm not sure how this goes. And he'll take it from there. All right. Let's say a prayer. Let's go forward. Now, here's the thing. As I know, once you bring in priests, you're like, I know. That's why I don't want to go to the confession my, to my priest. I, he's going to remember what I say. He's going to tell someone else. Listen, crazy thing is this. Do you know that the sacrament of confession has this thing called the seal of confession? Which is not this animal like, ar, ar, ar. The seal of confession <laughs> means that the priest cannot share ever whatever he's heard in confession. In fact, if a priest says what he heard in confession outside of confession, he's automatically excommunicated from the Catholic Church. Boom, right there. He's out. That's how seriously the church takes your being willing to trust Jesus with your sins. But I know, like, okay, maybe he won't say anything about it, but he'll think about it afterwards. I remember thinking this when I was in high school. Like, I go to confession, I see the priest later, and I'm just imagining that he sees me coming like, here comes that sinner. <laughs> so I asked him, I remember asking my priest, like, Father, hey, do you ever, like, remember stuff from confession? He's like... And he, he told me, he said, I don't remember a thing from confession. And I'm like, oh, gosh, that makes me feel so much better. I think you're lying, but it makes me feel so much better. <laughs> and then I became a priest, and I realized it's actually true. There's this thing, I call it divine amnesia. And what it is, <laughs> is that I cannot remember hardly anything I've ever heard from confession. It's very, very rare. And I think part of that is because of God's grace. Another part of it is this, and this is the next thing. Someone's like, well, I don't want to hand over the sin because the sin's going to shock the priest. Okay, so the second month I was ordained, I went to a federal penitentiary to hear confessions of the inmates of the federal penitentiary. I don't think there's much here we can say that's going to go past week, month number two of priesthood for me. I'm just, I'm just telling you. But here's the part of this reason why you're not going to shock the priest is because of this. Here, here's the thing. You, individuals, human beings, you are all, you are all precious little snowflakes and beautiful, unique budding flowers. Your sins aren't that special. Your sins aren't unique. You're unique. Your sins are not unique. That's kind of all the same. In fact, our sins are what? Our sins are basically like garbage. You don't do this with your garbage, right? Like, well, look at this special garbage I've got. No one else's banana peels like my banana peel. Like. <laughs> and so if, if sins are like garbage, then priests are like God's garbage men. And that's the thing is like, imagine a garbage man I mean, going through the garbage. He doesn't like, even on the first day of the job, he's not like, look at this. Oh my gosh, this is disgusting. Who had this? Put That house, they're the ones who had it. Like, they don't care. They're just like, eh, it's garbage. It's all garbage. And that's the same thing when it comes to your priest who you will go to confession to this weekend. Father, here's the stuff that's weighing me down. Hand it over to him. He's like, all right, I'm here. Just, you go into confession, you lay down the sin, you pick up the grace, you get out of there. That's all you have to do. You don't have to be afraid of what the priest is going to think. What he's going to think is, that is a heroic person. The thing the priest thinks when you go to confession is, there is a hero right in front of me right now. Someone who's willing to let Jesus love them. But you have to, you have to be willing to give them your sins. And so, and so the thing is like, how do you do it? Like, what are the sins? Well, uh, how do you confess your sins? Now, some of you might know how to do this already. In your lanyards, you actually have an examination of conscience. And at some point this week, and I invite you to take that out and go through it. I'm going to go through it relatively quickly. But here's the thing. When we go to confession, sometimes we fall into one of two traps. One trap is being um, way too general. The other trap is being way too specific. Here's what I mean. My oldest sister, um, she's kind of brassy, kind of sassy, and she said I could say this. So she was um, in confession once, and she said, okay, bless me, Father, for I've sinned, um, one through ten. And the priest was like, what's that? And she's like, one through ten. 
And he says, I, I'm not sure what you mean. She's like, uh, the commandments? Heard of them? I said, she's, she's sassy. And he's like, no, I understand the commandments. What do you mean? She's like, well, I broke them all. And he said, okay, well, did you kill anyone? No. Okay, did you do this? Like, no. She's all shocked, you know. And, and because, because when she read that, you know, the thou shalt not kill, underneath it also said, you know, get angry or fight with people. She's like, I've done that. So one through ten, that's way too general. You got to name the sin. You gotta, what's the name of the sin? Another way to do it is, like, what are all the, what are all the, the necessary elements of the sin? I have a priest, from, priest friend from Kenya who says, don't go into confession and say, Father, I stole a rope, and forget or neglect to mention that there was a cow attached to the rope. Because <laughs> there's a difference between saying, uh, Father, um, I hit someone, and I hit my mom <laughs> with the car <laughs> three times. So, so name, we have to name the sin. On the other hand, there's such a thing as being way too specific. And what I mean by that is this. You don't have to tell, like, tell the story of the sin. So there we were. <laughs> we were in the back seat of my Dodge Camaro, 1942, whatever. And we're at the corner of 11th and 12th. And she did this, and I did this, and she did this, and I did this, and she did this. Just impure actions with my girlfriend. There we go. Just that covers it. You don't have to tell the story of the sin. But we have to hand over everything that's significant. And uh, the, those significant sins are the mortal sins. We have to get them all out. You know, those mortal sins are what? They have, involve three elements. They involve, like, the, we know that they're a, big, they're a big deal sin, grave sin. We knew it. And we freely chose to do it anyways. The way I like to define sin is like this. God, I know what you want me to do. I don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do. That's it. It's not like, I rebel against you, Lord. It's just, I know that's what you want. I'd rather have me. God, I know what you want me to do. I don't care. I want to do what I want to do. So if it's a big deal sin, grave sin, I knew it was a sin, and I freely choose, chose to do it anyways, then I have, to, I have to hand all those out. have to give them all over. And what are some examples of this? Well, let's go through the commandments just really, really quickly. Commandment number one. Do you love God with everything you've got? What does that look like? Well, how about this? Let's start at the baseline. Um, did you spend time with your friends today? Yes. Did you pray today? No. Well, then you love your friends more than you love God. Did you work out today or train for your thing? Yes. Did you spend any time at all with God today? No. Then you love your workout, you love your sport, you love your whatever more than you love God. Did you eat today? Yes. Did you talk to God even once today? No. Then you love food more than you love God. Did you breathe today? Yes. Do so you even talk to God once today? No. Then you love being alive more than you love God. Basically, does he have any space in your calendar? Another one is, have I skipped, deliberately skipped Sunday Mass or Holy Days of Obligation? That's a big deal sin. One of those grave ones. Have I taken the name of the Lord God in vain? That includes like things like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. That's, people say like, I say oh my God, but I don't mean it. And I say, what do you think in vain means? <laughs> It means saying it without meaning it. It's even like, oh my God, this is a big deal. Honoring my father and mother. Obeying legitimate laws. Including the drinking age. Including the drinking age. Including the fact that marijuana is illegal in Minnesota. Including all these things. Number five. Did I kill anyone? No, there might be people here who need to hand it over. Honestly, someone who may have been so afraid and they found out they were pregnant and they decided to have an abortion tonight, this is an opportunity to let Jesus into that wound and let him at your heart. Maybe it's just having fights with people. Maybe it's getting into fist fights or using words to hurt them. Maybe it's hurting yourself. I know so many people who they just hate themselves and they hurt themselves. Listen, that's not your fault, but it is a wound. And that wound can be God's access point to your heart. So if you're cutting yourself, you're making yourself throw up, just give it to Jesus in confession. He loves you. He wants to heal you. Have I looked at impure images online, on TV? Have I read impure books, watched impure movies that objectified other people and reduced them to their parts? Have I had impure actions with myself, impure actions with someone else? Just hand that over. You say, I'm so embarrassed by that. Okay, whatever. It's just garbage. It's just an apple core that's just happened to rot. Just let them take it away. 
Have I gossiped? Have I lied? Have I cheated at school? Have I stolen anything? Last couple, have I been envious? With that, what envy is, is this. It's, I'm sad because you're happy. It's she's first chair, and I'm sad about that, but I would be happy if she lost first chair. Or he has an incredible truck, and I'm sad about that, but I'd be happy if he lost his truck. It's not the same thing as saying, cool truck, I'd like one too. Not the same thing. Last couple. I'm holding on to bitterness in my heart. Am I refusing to forgive someone? Because, you know, we pray this every time at the Our Father. God, forgive me how I forgive other people. And if I'm not willing to forgive anyone else, I'm basically saying, God, do not forgive me. Do not forgive me if I'm not willing to forgive those who have hurt me. Be able to come in to confession to drop off the sin pick of the grace. You know this because the sacrament of confession is the sacrament of God's love for imperfect people. The sacrament of confession is the sacrament of God's love for imperfect people. And this is the last thing. So often I talk to people who say when they go to confession, they, they go into confession like this. They go, okay, okay, I'm going to get geared up and I'm going to say, okay, God, please give me another chance. Give me another chance. Just God, I promise, if you forgive me, just give me another chance. I'll be perfect from now on. That's not what confession is. Confession is not us going into, into confession and saying, God, give me another chance. This is actually God saying, hey, would you give me another chance to love you? This is God asking you for another chance. This weekend, God is not asking you. God is not making you promise anything. What he's asking you to do is, will you give me permission to love you? Going to confession is giving God permission to love you just as you are, as an imperfect person, as someone who messes up, as someone who has sinned. And that's the question for this weekend. You know, we worship a limitless God. We worship an unstoppable God. The only thing that can stop an unstoppable God is your no. The only thing that can limit a limitless God is your no.